Okay, let's compare answers. Number one, how would you explain the protagonist's father's behavior, Colonel Sartoris? Well, what is his behavior? Let's look at page 10. The story begins when Colonel Sartoris is dragged before a justice of the peace. So in a place without a local courthouse, without a local judge, a roaming judge would wander around uh, or rotate around throughout the year. And he is known as a justice of the peace, not a specific judge. I guess in, in Chinese, we can call this like zong cai zi. So anyways, some trouble with the law. Um, and the complaint comes in this paragraph. Mr. Harris brings a complaint. I told you, the hog got into my corn. A hog is a pig. I caught it up and sent it back to him. He had no fence that would hold it. I told him so. I warned him. The next time I put the hog in my pen. So there was a next time the hog got into Mr. Harris's corn again. So the next time I kept the pig. When he came to get it, I gave him enough wire to patch up his pen. The next time the pig came again, I put the hog up and I kept it. I rode down to his house and saw the wire I gave him still rolled onto the spool in his yard. So Colonel Sartoris did not use the wire. I told him he could have the hog when he paid me a dollar pound fee. That evening, a black man came with a dollar and got the hog. He was a strange black man. He said, he say to tell you wood and hay can burn. I said, what? That's what he say to tell you, the black man said. Wood and hay can burn. That night, my barn burned. I got the stock out, but I lost the barn. So this is a very clear example of the kind of behavior of Colonel Sartorius. Why does he do that? Well, think about the events that we just read. His pig got away and messed around with somebody else's corn. And so the Mr. Harris gave him back his pig and said, you need to keep control of your pig. Then it happened again. And then uh, Mr. Harris gave him things to build a fence for his pig. But he didn't do it. And his pig got away again. And the third time, Mr. Harris says, you can get your pig back if you pay a dollar. And back in those days, a dollar was a lot of money. And following this, Colonel Sartoris burns down Mr. Harris's barn. So it looks like Colonel Sartoris does not like to follow orders. He doesn't like other people to tell him what to do. So I talked about this question with a few groups. Uh, one group, I think. I talked about this with one group. Uh, and this group gave some reasons. One reason is because the story is set in the American South after the Civil War. So after the Civil War, black people or formerly enslaved black people were now free, but they were still poor. On the other hand, we also have poor white people. And if the poor black people are now also free, then that means that black and white people are basically the same now. And for some poor white people, that does not feel right, or that did not feel right. They felt like because we're white, we should be treated better than these other black people. So maybe when Mr. Harris tells Colonel Sartoris to control your pig and uh, gives him materials and even asks him to pay money, Maybe that feels like he's being treated like a black person. He's not being given the respect 
that a white person deserves in his mind. And so maybe that's one reason why he keeps burning people's barns, because if he's poor, he has to work for other people. And if he screws up, other people are going to tell him you screwed up. You should do better. Here's what you should do. And so if every time this happens, he feels disrespected. And then he's going to burn their barn. And every time he burns somebody's barn, he gets caught. He gets dragged before the justice of the peace and the whole thing starts over again. So that's one possible reason, racial tension. But there's another possible reason. If you look at page 22, after Colonel Sartorius is shot and his son runs away, in the second to last paragraph, he remembers his father. Father, my father, he thought. He was brave, he cried suddenly. Cried means shout. Aloud, but not loud. No more than a whisper. He was. He was in the war. He was in Colonel Sartorius's cavalry. Cavalry is cavalry. Jibing. Uh, mounted soldiers riding horses. Not knowing that his father had gone to that war, a private in the fine old European sense. OK, so private today just means a regular soldier. But here it says there's a different meaning. Wearing no uniform, admitting the authority of and giving fidelity to no man or army or flag. So Colonel Sartoris went to war following nobody, being loyal to nobody. Going to war as Mel Brook himself did for booty. Booty is what you can steal from the enemy. It meant nothing and less than nothing to him if it were enemy booty or his own. So this tells us he would even steal from soldiers on the same side. In other words, Colonel Sartorius went to fight the Civil War not because he believed in his side, whether for or against slavery. He went to war to get rich. And it didn't matter to him where the money was found from the enemy, from his fellow soldiers. He didn't care. He took everything. He followed nobody. He was loyal to no one. Only to himself. So maybe the reason that Colonel Sartorius is so. Incalcitrant Nang is also part of his personality. He's been like this from the beginning. I think it's a pretty uh, wonderful thing about this story that it does not give us just one reason for a person's behavior. People are complex. People do things for many different reasons. And some of those reasons don't make sense with some other reasons. And so this ends up being a more realistic picture of a person because we're not exactly sure of the specific reasons. Question two, why does the story use vernacular spelling? Why does it spell words in the uh, American Southern dialect? This was a very popular question. So let's look at some examples. Page. Oh, I don't know. What page should it be? OK, so here's one. Page 13. This line begins with likely. 
Likely it ain't fitting for hogs, one of the sisters said. Uh, in regular English, or I guess standard English, this would be, it likely isn't even fit for hogs or pigs. Um, but it's spelled exactly the way that this character would pronounce these words. This character is the one of the protagonist's sisters. And then on the previous page, we have this line. Nah, he said, it don't hurt, let me be. Which in standard English would be, no, it doesn't hurt, let me be, or leave me alone. Again, spelled exactly the same way he would say these words. Uh, I think this is... I can't remember. This is also from his family. So his family members all speak with a heavy southern accent. But you also have characters. Oh, so this is his father. His father said this. But you also have characters who don't have an accent. For example, page 11. The justice of the peace. He says, hey, talk louder. Colonel Sartoris, I reckon anybody named for Colonel Sartoris in this country can't help but tell the truth, can they? So it's still in dialect. Because he uses the word reckon instead of think or believe. But the words are, are, are all spelled correctly. And so it means that the, his pronunciation is basically correct. So we know that it's not everybody whose speech is presented with an accent. So why does the author sometimes use vernacular spelling and not other times? So I talked with a lot of groups about this question. Everybody believed that this is one way to make the story feel more authentic. Like you're really hearing these characters talk. Uh, and that's true. We call this, uh, it gives the story a local flavor or a regional flavor. But that doesn't answer the question why some characters have an accent and others do not. Um, so some groups also mention maybe a stronger accent means that this character did not have a long time in education. Maybe they did not have the chance to hear how people in other places talk. In other words, maybe they are of a lower class. Maybe they have less money and opportunities, especially the protagonist family is farmers. So maybe they have to spend all day farming and they don't have the chance to educate themselves very well. And I think that's uh, a reason that makes sense. It could be a way for the author to show us the character's background and the character's design and personality very quickly, very efficiently. And so that tells us that Colonel Sartoris uses a kind of more primitive way of thinking about things like pride, honor, justice, human relationships, and that these ways of thinking may not fit the society of the day after the Civil War. So yes, this could be one reason to help with the character design and personality. At the same time, we should remember in real life, just because somebody has an accent does not mean that they are poorer or less educated or from a lower class. Uh, it doesn't really tell us anything except for where they grew up. Um, this is simply one way for fiction to efficiently tell us about a character. 
So if you're reading nonfiction and the author gives a person a strong accent, you should think why? What is the author trying to say about this person? And is it fair? Number three, why do you think the author often uses long, sometimes ungrammatical sentences? Let's see if we can find an example of this. OK, uh, how about page 21? Uh, this really long paragraph in the middle. So here Sardi is running away. He realizes his father is going to go burn up another barn and he decides to run away to warn that person, Major Despain. So his family try to grab him, but he runs away. Then he was free. His aunt grasped at him, but it was too late. So far, these are still complete sentences. He whirled, which means turned around, running. His mother stumbled forward onto her knees behind him, crying to the nearer sister, catch him, Net, catch him. OK, so we're starting to lose the grammar. He whirled running. This is a complete sentence. Sorry. Uh, this is a complete sentence. His mother stumbled forward, blah, 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 is another complete sentence. Therefore, this should be a period in the middle, not a comma. Right, you can't connect two complete sentences with one comma. But that was too late too. the sister. The sisters were twins born at the same time, yet either of them now gave the impression of being encompassing as much living meat and volume and weight as any other two of the family. Not yet having begun to rise from the chair, her head, face alone merely turned, presenting to him in the flying instant an astonishing expanse of young female features untroubled by any surprise, even wearing only an expression of bovine interest. Now that's a long sentence. But the grammar is correct. Should I analyze this sentence for you? OK. This is the main sentence that was too late. The sister skipping the parenthesis, not yet having. So this is what's known as participle construction. Uh, with an independent subject. Uh, merely turned presenting still using the present participle. And wearing. So this is actually a grammatically complete sentence. And in the middle, this parenthesis is also complete. The sisters were twins born at the same time, yet conjunction. Either of them now gave the impression of being encompassing. This is a positive, right? These two words are supposed to mean the same thing. As much living meat and volume and weight as any other two of the family. The parenthesis is saying that these two sisters were twins. But now as the protagonist is running away and he's running away from the arms of one of the sisters, he feels like they don't just resemble each other. They resemble any person of the family because to him, all of these people are just trying to keep him from running away. That there's no difference in that moment. And what about the bigger sentence? Uh, that was too late because his sister had not yet even begun to stand up. Uh, and instead, all he could see was her head, face, alone, turned, presenting to him 
an astonishing expanse of young female features untroubled by any surprise. Wearing only an expression of bovine interest. Bovine means like a cow. So he's saying as he runs past his sister, she did not even have the chance to stand up. She could only turn her face toward him. And in that moment, the only thing he noticed about her face is that it lacked any surprise, it had nothing on her face, just like a cow. So it's describing his sister as not really um, alert, not really in the moment, reacting very slowly. But it's still a complete sentence. What about the next one? Then he was out of the room, out of the house, in the mild dust of the starlit road and the heavy ripeness of honeysuckle, the pale ribbon unspooling with terrific slowness under his running feet, reaching the gate at last and turning in, running, his heart and leg lungs drumming on up the drive toward the lighted house, the lighted door. Technically, almost grammatical. There's one mistake in this sentence. Here, the subject should be he. Uh, and so when you change the subject, the pale ribbon, this is talking about uh, the road. The road is lit by starlight, so it looks pale. So he's comparing it to a ribbon. Unspooling, which means unrolling, which means the road is passing under him very quickly. Or I guess with terrific slowness, it's passing under him very slowly. So the, the, the subject has changed. The new subject is the pale ribbon. We're again using an independent par, uh, participle construction. But then the next verb is reaching. The subject of this verb is again the main character. So we have gone from subject A to subject B and then back to subject A still using a participle construction. You can't do that. A participle construction, uh, if you change subjects, the subject has changed. You can't change back like this. But other than that, the grammar is correct. It's just very long. But in the next sentence, he did not knock, he burst in, sobbing for breath, incapable for the moment of speech. So this comma is wrong. This should be something else. And then a semicolon. So Faulkner does know what a semicolon is. He saw the astonished face of the Negro in the linen jacket without knowing when the Negro had appeared. Okay, so. This paragraph has a couple of very long sentences, but the grammar is mostly correct. The question is, why are these sentences so long? Why doesn't the author give us shorter sentences? Well, speaking of short sentences, do you remember a few weeks ago we read To Build a Fire by Jack London? The guy is in Alaska, there's a dog, it's very cold. He decides to build a fire. He keeps making mistakes and he freezes to death. That sentence had very short, uh, that story had very short sentences. And when I asked you about that, some of you said it's to give us the sense of one thing after another. Shit keeps happening. Uh, and by the end of the story, he's unable to solve all of those problems. And as things happen, he doesn't have time to react. He doesn't have time to think about what's going on. He can only react. He, he can only take action. So if short sentences emphasize action, emphasize pressure and urgency, what about long sentences? Would they be the opposite? Could they emphasize thinking? 
Could they emphasize the process? Well, if we look back at this example, what's going on here? He's running away. The main character is running away. And this whole paragraph is describing what he sees as he runs. So starting, he whirled running. His mother, okay, sorry, let's start here. That was too late too. The sister had not yet begun to stand up. So as he passed, he saw her face was completely empty of surprise, looked like a cow's face. Then he was out of the room, out of the house. Did you notice that? First out of the room, then out of the house. It's because when you leave the house, you're just passing through another door. So these two parts of the sentence are almost the same. It's just leaving door after door after door. Out of the room, out of the house, in the mild dust of the starlit road. Right, leaving the room, leaving the house, he's now on the road. And the heavy ripeness of honeysuckle. Honeysuckle is a flower. So he's smelling the smell of the flower. The pale ribbon is referring to the to the road under his feet. Unspooling with terrific slowness under his running feet. So he's he thinks that he's not running fast enough. The road is moving by too slowly. Have you ever had that dream? You're running, but no matter how hard you run, you just can't go fast enough. In fact, you might even be slowing down. It's very similar to that experience. And then reaching the gate at last. So he that part of the road was just uh, he reached the gate of uh, Major Despain's house. He reached the front gate and turning in. So he got to the gate. He's turning to go into the front yard. Running his heart and lungs drumming. Uh, like beating very hard. Going on up the drive. A drive is where you would put. Um, what do you call this in Chinese? So the part of it's a private part of the road. Like if you think of those big houses in front, there will always be a small road where you can park your horse or you can park your car. That is a drive. A private road. So maybe that's an industrial road. Um, on up the drive toward the lighted house. So there's a light on in the house. Somebody is at home. Somebody is still awake. The lighted house, the lighted door. So this is the opposite of when he was leaving, right? Out of the room, out of the house. Now at the house and then at the door. So why are these sentences so long? Because when the character is going through these experiences, it all feels like one long experience. From leaving his house to getting to Major Despain's house, all the way there, he's only thinking about one thing. He has to go faster. And that's why the there's also a separation between running away from his family and leaving the house, right? Bovine interest, period, end of sentence. The first sentence is about getting away from his family and their reactions. The second sentence is about making it to Major Despain's house in time. So, you know, there's a reason Faulkner uses these long sentences. They give you an idea of the character's subjective experience. This is what it feels like to the character. Especially in moments of heightened tension or excitement. When you're caught up in the moment and you don't have time to think about what's going on. So in fact, it's very similar to Jack London's short sentences. 
it's also one thing after another, except here, all of these things are in the same sentence. Uh, you can think about it this way. If everything is a short sentence, then the whole thing is like one long sentence. Okay, question four. Was the protagonist right to warn Major to Spain? Uh, one group took this question. Uh, it's a it's an ethical dilemma. You know that your father should not be burning his barn. You know that if his barn burns down, he will lose lots of valuable property and um, crops. But at the same time, the person burning the barn is your father. The person who you've known since you could remember, the person who's been the head of your family always. And you kind of understand your father. You kind of know that he is a proud person. You know what situations have triggered him to want to take revenge. You understand him. And he's your father but you still know that it's wrong. So what should you do? When answering this question, it, I think it's important to remember that this is not the first time that he has seen his father burn somebody's barn. This is just the last time. So every time his dad burns somebody's barn, he has to think to himself, should I warn them? Or should I keep silent and stick with my family? And every time he has chosen the second option. But this one time he decides to do what he thinks is right. And he warns Major de Spain that his dad is going to come burn the barn. He doesn't even give a full sentence. If you look at page 21. Uh, right after the paragraph we were just looking at. He did not knock. He burst in, sobbing for breath, incapable for the moment of speech. He saw the astonished face of the Negro in the linen jacket without knowing when the Negro had appeared. So this is Major Despain's servant, a black servant. Despain, he cried, panted. So he's still trying to catch his breath. Where's? Then he saw the white man too emerging from a white door down the hall. So Major de Spain has appeared. Barn, he cried. Barn. What? The white man said. Barn? Yes, the boy cried. Barn. Catch him, the white man shouted. But it was too late this time too. And uh, the protagonist runs away again. So his only warning is to shout the word barn. Uh, and apparently Despain understood what he meant. So really, the protagonist is doing the bare minimum uh, that he has to do in order to pass on the warning. It's the, it's the smallest act of betrayal that the protagonist could do. So we know that even in his own heart, he is very conflicted. He doesn't know whether he really should do this, but he feels that it is the right thing to do. But I think this question should be left open to each of us. If you realize that a family member is about to do something terrible, should you try to stop it? Uh, I guess in each case, it would depend on how bad is the thing? How close are you with the family member? And what do you think might happen if you warn the person? Now, in this case, Sarti, protagonist, is only 10 years old. I don't think he really thought about what would happen. He probably was just thinking, if I tell Major to Spain, then everything can be stopped. And that's it. But it turns out that the way Major de Spain stops his barn from burning is apparently to shoot Colonel Sartoris. 
apparently we don't know. Uh, because moving on to question five, the ending. Uh, Sardi does not want to be caught by Despain's servant, so he keeps running again. And as he runs, he heard the shot. And an instant later, two shots. Pausing now without knowing he had ceased to run, crying, Pap, Pap, so like his dad running again before he knew he had begun to run, and he keeps running. Panting, sobbing, father, father. So it seems like Despain shot his dad, but we don't know. We don't have proof. Uh, but I guess he himself believes that his dad is now dead. Because in on the next page, in the middle of this paragraph, he's suddenly remembering his dad, even trying to defend his dad's reputation. Father, my father, he thought. He was brave, he cried suddenly, aloud, but not loud, no more than a whisper. We looked at this earlier, right? But why is he saying this? He's saying, but my dad was brave. He was not a worthless, poor white man. He had value. He's trying to defend his father against everyone against the universe. So it does look like he did not expect his dad to die. But now that his dad is dead, he probably can't go back because he's the person who indirectly caused his father's death. So he ran, he ran, and now he stopped. The slow constellations wheeled on. So the stars in the sky kept moving. It would be dawn and then sun up after a while and he would be hungry, but that would be tomorrow. And now he was only cold and walking would cure that. His breathing was easier now and he decided to get up and go on. And then he found that he had been asleep because he knew it was almost dawn, the night almost over. Uh, and then if we jump down a few lines here, he got up in the middle, he got up. He was a little stiff, but walking would cure that too, as it would the cold, and soon there would be the sun. He went on down the hill toward the dark woods, within which the liquid silver voices of the birds called unceasing. The rapid and urgent beating of the urgent inquiring heart of the late spring night. Quiring means inquiring, asking questions. He did not look back. So when I discussed this question with you guys, most of you said that it did seem hopeful. Some groups said no, it did not seem like a hopeful ending because the dude is 10 years old, lost his family, hungry, cold. How can that be hopeful? But if you look at this last paragraph, look at the details. It's almost dawn. He goes toward the chirping alive birds in the forest. It's late spring. And he did not look back. And all of his problems he could solve later. The story tries very hard to make this seem hopeful. Uh, and then also like this line, his breathing was easier now. It means after he had a short rest, but we can also explain this as now that he's free of his father, his breathing was easier now. So objectively speaking, it's a terrible situation, but subjectively speaking, he sees and feels hope in his future. Now that he is away from his father and his family. And really that's part of the power of literature. Because like, 
life is objectively terrible. You lose people, you lose pets, and then you die. But literature can help you focus on the details, the signs of wonder, the things that make each waking moment full of joy and possible happiness. Even a situation as terrible as this one can still be described in very hopeful words using very hopeful details. In a way, this is a good example of how literature can affect the way we look at a situation. Even in the worst situations, there's always a, a, some way to look at it with a sense of hope. Question six, how can you tell it was written in the interwar era? So let's go back to the top of this handout. Let's see, what do we have? We have some um, literature related to black people, right? Passing, we have the Harlem Renaissance. Um, so more and more people became interested, sorry, more and more white people became interested in the experiences of black people. Um, and this story is kind of uh, connected to that. The story is about white people, but their psychology and their society is deeply connected with the experiences of black people being freed after the Civil War, being competition on the labor market, working for richer white people. Um, all of that is in the background. And then, of course, William Faulkner is one of the most important authors of this period, but you can't say that on the final exam. This story is an example of modernism. The main character ends up leaving his family. It's a kind of symbolism for losing tradition. Um, the way that the story is written, giving some characters accents and others not, is a kind of political characterization. It's using the different ways of building characters uh, and putting a sense of class and politics into those characters. So it's connected with aesthetic politics. It's very connected with psychoanalysis. Colonel Sartorius does stuff for reasons that are not 100% clear. The main character faces a choice in his life, and even when he makes one choice, he's not exactly clear about the consequences. He didn't sit down, open Excel, and do a pro versus con analysis, right? He followed his instinct. And instincts are sometimes good, sometimes bad, often both. These ideas are all connected with fragmenting the human mind, having contradictory desires, ideas that we find in psychoanalysis. And then, of course, his family's poor, so that's connected with the Great Depression. Uh, when the Great Depression began with farmers. Uh, after farming the same place for so long using new technology, the land became dry, farming became impossible, uh, food became scarce, farmers did not were not able to sell enough to make money, and that affected the stock market and the futures market, qi huo, and the whole thing came tumbling down. So talking about poor farmers is also something that uh, people would care more about after the Great Depression. Uh, and then you, we also have a, a bigger focus on Southern literature, right? 1936, Gone with the Wind is also set in the American South, in Georgia. Uh, so in this period, the American South also became more important in the cultural imagination. Yeah, those are the main uh, features of the interwar period that we can see in this story. Questions? 
those people who are still awake? OK, so next week we're going to read five poems by Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes is the most famous poet of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, which is literature focused on the experiences of black people. Five poems shouldn't be too hard, and they're very short and they're easy to understand because black poetry, a lot of black poetry, comes from the oral tradition, which means that they're meant to be spoken, meant to be performed. So even when you write them down, they can seem less complicated. Less complicated does not mean less complex. Just because it's easy to read does not mean it's easy to understand all of it. As I'm sure you should know by now. Uh, and then next week I will also pass out the last handout and I will introduce you to the post-war period or the late 20th century. OK, uh, so remember, remember to come next week to pick up the new handout. And if you have not yet signed in,